Hello, Sarah. Hello, Jocelyn. Hey, how are you? Hello. Bye. How are you doing? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it's Friday. We're doing a presentation. Seems exciting. <laughs> yeah, well, be, be grateful for small things. <laughs> Just uh, when I realized yesterday that I never, we never decided who's going to like have the PowerPoint up. Does it matter to you? Nope. I don't care either way. Okay. Okay. And what we'll want to do is, you know, you know, in, you know, at, at two, we'll, you know, admit everyone else. Um, and, would, but I, it would be good to just have that PowerPoint up um, when we launch. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I'm just gonna I'm just gonna monitor the the waiting room um, and get everyone in, okay. and basically just stay out of your way mm. um, for the duration. Sweet. Um, I don't know if I I, I guess we maybe we mentioned this um, at the last meeting or maybe not. Um, it, it it is being recorded. Transcripts are being automatically generated. The transcripts I, that we have looked at have, all, you know, some oddities because Zoom does not understand what Alma is, or Community Zone, or things like that. So um, when we get the the recording and the transcript, um, there's going to need to be some sort of hand editing to sort of clean it up. Um, and so I'll let you um, deal with that to just sort of make sure that it's saying on the screen, you know, on the captioning what you intend to say rather than some bizarre automatic translation. Slightly um, desperate interpretation of my words. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, you know, it, it does very well with, with normal words. It's just the sort of like, you know, the jargon, you know, like, like in the, one of the earlier ones we had, we had sin all and it had no idea what that was <laughs> um, or EBSCO host or things like that. Um, but it's, 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 it's mostly pretty good. Um, okay. And yeah, and so then we will, um, you know, when we, we you know, we, you know the, the first two presentations are being edited now and, um, you know, as soon as we can get those things clean and ready, we'll, we'll put them up on Basecamp and people can, you know, binge watch if they wish. Sounds uh, good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, because, you know, you can't get enough. It's true. I mean, e-resources and acquisitions, <laughs> the stuff of dreams. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we'll have, you know, they, they, they can watch all four parts, you know, nonstop. <laughs> um, all right. So let me just sort of see what's going on here. It looks like we have one person in the waiting room for the, for the past, um, the past couple of things we had about, I think 42 or 43 wow. people, which I thought was a lot. Um, wow. You know, maybe people really don't have Anything else to do That's on a Friday afternoon? Mm -hmm. That's um, probably what it is. You know, so right now we got five people, or no, well, I guess we got two, two, two people in addition to us are in the waiting room, and so um, it's now. Let's see, where's my time? So, Can you guys so, see the slide? I see the slide with the green border. It looks great. Great, great. Okay. Um, yeah, when I was writing the survey, I was really tempted to like give options you know why did you come to this session my boss made me um <laughs> and i was like no let's not front load it yeah. see what they say no i thought it was it was it was to you know so simple to the point you cool. know and it's got the open-ended thing for people who really want to rant and or rave yes So when we get a few more, um, I'll just send a message that says, you know, we're getting set up and we'll admit people at two. And then at two, I will admit all. Occasionally, you know, like, you know, you, there, there's a couple of stragglers. Um, but I would say you, you can pr pretty much just plan on, on starting right on time. Okay. And then uh, other than that, I mean, and, you know, I, I, what has been happening is people have been doing sort of questions in the chat, um, and then you can sort of address them, 
you know, as, as, as you feel, um, you know, is the right time. You don't have to, to, to address them as soon as they come in. If you want to wait for, for the, the right moment to do that. And um, I guess both of the first ones, maybe they ran over just a little bit, um, but not too bad. There really have you know, there, you know, there weren't too many questions sort of at the end. Um, people would just sort of, you know, ask, ask a couple of questions in the, during the, during the presentation. And then by the time we got to the end, they didn't have anything more to say. Okay. Cool. And then are you going to be also, are, are you doing, is it just PowerPoint or is it also live? Um, Alma, it, anything? It's both. I think um, Jocelyn was planning to share some stuff in her section from, okay. uh, sorry, George, George Mason. Yeah, okay. George yeah. Mason. <laughs> I was like, it's one fine. of the Georges and. Um, it's confusing. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> And oh, I'll get used to it. And I was going to show some stuff from AU. Okay, and you and and you you are thoroughly conversant with how to share the appropriate things. And you transfer. know, we'll find out. You know, I yes, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with it. Okay, good. Just trying to close down some stuff so I have bandwidth. We're getting a couple more people. We now have four, four in the waiting room, five in the waiting room. Okay. So it's three minutes of. I should probably go lock the cats out of the room. Looks like we got 13 in the waiting room and one minute to go. And then I will just, you know, if there's anyone, I'll, you know, I'll just sort of make sure that people 
have video turned off and are muted and all that kind of stuff. Um, 17 in the waiting room now. And it is 2 p.m. Are we ready? As we'll ever be. Yeah. All right. Here we go. I'm admitting all. And I'm going to mute myself. And whoops, you have it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to today. We're talking about e-resources and acquisitions in Alma. Um, just to do a brief introduction, my name is Sarah. I am the Electronic Resources and Serials Librarian at American University, and I will allow Jocelyn to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jocelyn. I'm the Head of Resource Acquisition at George Mason University. So, um, sorry, having technical difficulties. So here's the agenda for what we plan to cover today. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, all libraries in WRLC use Alma's acquisitions differently to support their own institutional needs and staffing. So please check your local guidelines and procedures to find out how your institution uses acquisitions before you go rogue. Um, first, we'll discuss vendors in some depth. We'll cover PO lines or POLs with a brief foray into renewals. And then lastly, we'll discuss invoicing. We do plan to leave plenty of time for questions at the end, but of course, welcome to submit questions to the chat as we go along. One of us will monitor the chat to ask questions of the presenter. So first off, we're going to talk about vendors. So just a note, in order to edit vendors, you must have the vendor manager role. Um, roles are confusing in Alma, and so uh, Jocelyn had the brilliant idea of including them before uh, all of the, the, the topics we're covering. So there are different types of vendor records. When creating a vendor record, you must specify the type of record it is, material supplier, provider, licensor, or governmental. The vendor record has to be at least one of the four, but it can also be all of the four. This is entirely up to the institution to determine how they want to use the vendors. Um, the basic level is material supplier. But there really isn't a right or a wrong way besides having a supplier. So if a vendor is a material buyer, it means that it is a vendor that gets paid for services or for content. So for example, EBSCO would be a material supplier for its journal services through EBSCOnet and its database content through EBSCO host. If a vendor is an access provider, that vendor provides an interface for access to a resource. To extend my previous example, EBSCO could be a material supplier for journals through EBSCOnet and database content through EBSCO host and an access provider for EBSCO host. If a vendor is a licensor, it means that they provide some form of licensing information for their content. Often a vendor will be a licensor and another one of the categories like an access provider or a material supplier. So again, to keep on my EBSCO example, EBSCO would be a licensor for their database content, but not for the e-journals we purchase through EBSCO net. Those journals and their publishers would have their own vendor records, which would be a, an access provider and a licensor. Uh, there is a, a record type of governmental, but I've never used it, so I'm not even going to pretend what, that I know what it is. Um, I welcome if there are people on the in the session who do know what it is and have good use cases, um, please chime in at the end. So this right here is a screenshot of the results that you'll see if you do a vendor search in Alma. You may notice that this vendor has an additional type, a sushi vendor. This is not one of the four options you can choose when you create the vendor record, but Kristen will be discussing usage statistics next week, and I imagine she will cover um, this as part of her presentation. So since I used EBSCO as an example to describe the types of vendors, I thought I would show you what it looks like um, with a screenshot. We will be getting into live Alma, but I'm gonna start with screenshots. Um, this is the EBSCO vendor record at AU. 
You can see in the green box up above that it is listed as a material supplier subscription agent and access provider and a licensor. Material supplier vendor accounts uh, or vendor types, I'm sorry, must have accounts. So you can see that we have a lot of accounts, um, but there is always an option to describe them so you can differentiate um, more easily rather than just having to memorize numbers. Access provider vendor types must also have interfaces. So we only have one setup, EBSCO host for EBSCO. The vendor record is really the backbone of Am Alma acquisitions. Um, vendor information is used to create POLs. It's used to code in licenses about who, um, who is licensing which content and to add interface information to electronic collections. So in vendor records, these are the pieces that I think are important for e-resources. I'll talk more specifically about accounts and interfaces, contacts and notes. Um, I am going to just use screenshots for the linked POLs and invoices because of um, uh, confidential price data. Um, and I did want to again remind you that Kristen will be discussing usage data next week, so I am not going to cover that at all. Um, and Jocelyn will briefly mention EDI later. So accounts and interfaces. Um, accounts include necessary payment and activation information. So you can choose which payment method your institution wants to use, how long after ordering it you expect the resource to be activated, and other information that will populate through and determine the way that a POL um, is processed through the system. You can have multiple accounts, as you've seen previously, <laughs> with EBSCO. Interfaces, on the other hand, can be used to track administration information. So statistics logins, troubleshooting logs, administrative logins, and more. Um, I think that when Ex Libris invented the vendor module, its intention was to roll in traditional ERM, so electronic management systems functionality, into the interface, um, which is how we are using it at AU. I've included a screenshot. These are the different categories of information that you can um, find under the vendor interface. So you have contact information, administrative, access, statistics, inventory, and notes. Again, we'll get into that um, in the live data. Next, we're gonna look at the linked POLs and invoices. So because the vendor is used to populate the material supplier in the POLs, the PO lines, and the vendor is used to create invoices, you can see linked POLs and invoices from within the vendor's records. So this screenshot shows what this section of the vendor record would look like. Um, you may notice that there are facets similar to what you would see if you did an order line search. Um, this is still within the vendor record. So when you click out to another tab, for instance, let's say contact information, those filters will disappear. So you might be asking yourself, why would you even use this? You have an order search in Alma. This seems kind of extraneous. Um, I would say that I find personally in Alma that it's always really helpful to have multiple ways into the data in the system um, as a fail safe. Next, we'll look at contact information and notes. <laughs> contact information is yet another place to store useful information. Uh, one of the th things that's nice about vendor records or perhaps uh, an added level of complexity is that your information can actually be put in many different places. Um, so Ex Libris has added the option to choose different URLs, uh, URL types. So you can see here um, that I've highlighted them in green. This is on the contact information tab. You can add web addresses, you can add email addresses, phone numbers, physical addresses. Um, so theoretically, you could, instead of using the interface of the vendor record to track your, um, your ER MS traditional data, you could actually put it in the contact tab. Notes are also very helpful. Um, I tend to use them specifically to track decisions, to track vendor changes, like when one vendor eats another vendor, um, and other pieces of institutional knowledge that I want more than just my unit to potentially have access to. Uh, I would also recommend, though, that it's important to back these notes up in some form of institutional drive, um, simply because at this point it is not easy or I believe feasible to get the notes out of the vendor records in analytics. 
So before we go into the live example, are there any questions? Okay, hold on one second. Oh, I thought I had logged in and I apparently had not. Oh, it's gonna be interesting. Okay, you guys should see a browser. I am gonna log into Alma. Um, in my eagerness to make sure I had bandwidth, I closed all of my windows and foolishly closed my browser, but mistakes will happen. So I am gonna show you guys Ex Libris in our system just to kind of click through and uh, give you an opportunity to look at the vendor record. So there's a few ways to get to it. You can click on acquisitions. It is one of the options under the acquisitions infrastructure. So you can click here to be taken to your full vendor list. There is also a drop down menu that allows you to search from within the home page. I tend to use this um, um, exclusively, especially if I know the vendor, but if I don't, I get frustrated and I will go to the vendor list and scroll through the names. So like Alma, there's several ways in. You can always click the edit or just on the green text. The green text is blue, the blue text. So again, you can see here that the vendor type is the same as EBSCO. Um, we do have the currency specified in the vendor, vendor's general details, but if you scroll down, you'll notice the accounts page. Um, we have two, one specifically for our firm orders and one for our main orders, so serials versus acquisitions. I'm going to click into this one, the serials one. So again, you can add account description. I don't know if you remember from the screenshot, but this is where we had um, more of the human friendly text to describe uh, what the account referred to. Um, I think a good uh, practice is to actually use the appropriate account number that the vendor has just because it can be useful down the road, but this can be difficult to track and maintain because vendors change and account numbers change. You can see here the account, uh, the payment method. So we tend to at AU pay most of our stuff through the accounting department, but we will have some vendors that are credit card um, uh, as well. Lastly, in this, I want to show this delivery and claim information. And I specifically want to show you, um, so the expected receipt after ordering. This is basically you're telling the system um, in the POL that when you order something, a firm book or a journal, you expect it to come within a certain number of days. The same thing is true for activations, except that it's electronic. So you say, I ordered this in January and I expect it to be activated in March. Both of these fields, if left blank, will default to, uh, I believe it's one day. And these fields are also the two that create activation tasks um, and can cause, I think, the overdue receiving notes that you get. So this is something that you can customize per vendor. Um, we have not done that at AU for a variety of completely legitimate reasons, um, but it is something to um, keep in mind that if you're really frustrated, specifically with your activation task list, that's something you can customize. You'll notice up here that there is contact information and contact people. I think this is too deep um, within the record to bother putting in. So um, I generally don't use it because I forget to look here. Next, we'll come down to interfaces. We have two here, unlike EBSCO, where we had one. And just so you can get a sense of what it looks like, you have your summary. Um, again, you have your user readable text. At AU, we're using this um, because we merged from two systems in TOTA 360 and Voyager. And so this is a good way to build crosswalks um, between the different vendors that we had to merge. Our administrative information is right here. So this is how we're using our ERM. We have our user ID, um, the URL, that kind of information. Statistics tends to be the same as the admin, but periodically you will have a separate login. And so this is one of the places that um, we track that. The last thing I wanted to show in the interface has to do with the inventory. So you may remember that I mentioned that the interface is populated into the electronic collections. 
And one of the benefits of this is that it then becomes tied to that interface. So this is another inroad into your data. A side note though about the interfaces. So Ex Libris has, I hesitate to use controlled vocabulary because I feel like there's catalogers on the call who will beat me for inaccurate usage, but um, it has a set vocabulary of names that it uses. And these are populated through the CZ or the uh, community zone. So if you migrated your data and your name of um, your face doesn't match the CZ collection that you activated, it's not necessarily gonna be in your interface. So that's something that can be cleaned up, but doesn't necessarily need to be. Um, again, just to reiterate, I like lots of inroads into my data and this is another way to get in. So just a quick uh, drive through the contact information. You see you've got your physical addresses, phone numbers that you can add, email addresses. We actually need to add our um, main rep to that. And then your web addresses. This is the other place I was telling you where you could put some of that traditional ERMS information. So instead of, for instance, putting it in the interface in the way that I did, um, it might be fewer clicks if you put it in the contact information. You'll notice there is a contact people tab. I tend to not use this because I, I personally don't like creating user records for vendors um, because this treats them in some ways like a, like a patron. It's not a one-to-one, -one, but I prefer this method because they change frequently and it's easier to just delete this um, than go through all the steps of adding someone new. Again, usage data is going to be discussed next week. It is really interesting, so I encourage you to go, but you have the invoices and POLs um, which I showed you the screenshot of. And then lastly, the notes. This is an example of a note where I got an email about sushi harvesting and I wanted more than just myself to be able to access it, including more than just my unit. So I went ahead and posted it um, within the vendor record um, just so that more than just me can see what's there, okay? Questions about that? Okay, um, I'm gonna pass the presentation on to Jocelyn to discuss POLs in more depth, but you'll hear from me again when we get to renewals. Jocelyn. All right, thanks Sarah. Can you stop sharing and then I will jump on. Okay. All right, can you all see that okay? Yes. Okay, thanks. All right, so purchase order lines or PO lines or POLs um, are what every order in Alma has to have. Um, so if you're going to be working with PO lines you with and electronic resources, you need the following roles, electronic inventory operator, electronic inventory operator extended. Um, you need the extended if you're going to be deleting anything. And then you either need purchasing operator or purchasing manager. So the basic purchasing workflow in Alma is order activation and invoicing. Um, we're really gonna only cover ordering and invoicing today. Activation was covered in the two previous sessions. So I would encourage you to check those out when the recordings become available if you have question, questions about activating. Um, an order, like I said, has to have a purchase order line and I'll go into all the details of that shortly. Once it's created, it goes through a validation phase um, that checks for all the mandatory information and additional review phases, depending on how you've set up your instance of Alma. And then once it's approved, that purchase order line gets packaged into a purchase order or PO, at which point that means the order is ready to be sent to the vendor, um, either within Alma or outside the system. 
Anytime you create an electronic order, the title will go through an activation process. And this is in contrast to the receipt process you would need for physical items. Um, like I said, the activation process was already covered, so we won't be going over it in too much depth today. And then that final step is invoicing when we finally pay for a resource. So once a title or POL completes the activation and invoicing process, those orders will either close or if it's a subscription, um, will remain in the waiting for renewal status. So that brings me to statuses. Um, I know there's a lot of text on this slide, so I apologize. But as a POL moves through the ordering workflow, its status will change to reflect kind of where it is in the process. Um, when you first initiate a purchase order line, it will get the in review status. This is, you know, when you add all that mandatory information, any notes, links to other POLs, all that kind of thing, um, it will stay in the in review phase. When you're ready to send that purchase order line into a purchase order or PO, um, it will go through either a manual or automatic packaging phase. Once it's packaged into the PO, the PO is ready to go. Um, it will move through the ready and sent phases. And then finally, as I said, if it's a one-time order, once that purchase order line has been invoiced and the e-resource activated, it will move to close. If it's a subscription, it will move to waiting for renewal or manual renewal. Um, and waiting for invoice sometimes happens when the PO line has been fully activated but not fully invoiced. And so you'll see the waiting for invoice um, status there. There's also a deferred status, and this is an optional status you can choose to use or not, and it kind of lets you set aside a PO line to be handled at a later date. We sometimes use this if um, we think something's ready to go, we start entering all the information, and then we find out it needs a new license, or there's not enough funds or something like that that might significantly delay a process, we move it to the deferred status. We tend to keep in review for things we're working on immediately. Um, and then finally, the last status is canceled. Um, and that is pretty self-explanatory. So purchase order lines contain most of the important ordering data um, about about a resource. So it will have your order type, the continuity one time versus a subscription, um, your acquisition method, the price, the fund, renewal dates, vendor, all of that kind of information will live in the PO line. There are some fields that are unique to e-resources and I wanted to point out a handful here. So the access model um, this is really useful, particularly for eBooks. This defines how many concurrent end users can access a resource. And when you're creating a PO line um, for a portfolio, for an eBook or an e-journal, that access model then automatically gets reflected in the portfolio, which is kind of a nice, a nice feature. And just one thing to note about that, say you had an active portfolio um, and it said that the use was one concurrent user. If you then create a PO line from that portfolio and change the access model, um, it will override the data in the activated portfolio. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, another field unique to e-resources is a license. Um, the license, like Sarah was saying, I think the more ways you can get information associated with each other and Alma, the easier it is to find. Um, and so entering the license at the PO is, is very helpful for that. The access provider, um, this is the vendor inter interface of the material being ordered. So it often is different to the material supplier or vendor. As Sarah was saying, when we were looking at the vendor record, sometimes you order something from say EBSCONET, your subscription agent, but the access provider is going to be whoever is hosting that journal. So Cambridge, Elsevier, ProQuest, whoever. Um, so you can add that information there. And then you can also manually add um, those expected activation after ordering days or date. 
Again, those can be defined in the vendor records. Um, if they're not, you can manually change them to what you want them to be in, at each PO line. And finally, you can add um, an e-activation due after ordering alert. And this will, if you have it set up in your system, um, it will notify you via letter that something hasn't been, been activated and it's been a while. One thing to note about the different PO line types is that they are customizable and so they might be unique to each library. Um, the list you see here are the ones that we use most frequently at Mason for electronic resources. Um, but your, your institution might use different ones. We don't really use database very often, if ever. Uh, we don't use access very often. Um, but I know other schools do. So that's just one thing to keep in mind that um, the things you see in my instance of Alma might not be the same for you. And more about the type. So you do have, like I was saying, your one-time, these are one-time orders such as eBooks or journal back files, archival, electronic collections. Um, and that will move to closed once the invoice comes in and the resource is activated. You have your continuous orders, which are for anything that's a subscription, e-journals, electronic collections, that type of thing. Your, that, that PO line will always remain open. Um, you have to manually close it. At no point will it automatically close. Um, Alma always assumes that you were going to want to renew something. License upgrade. This is a newer purchase type, and it's kind of a cool one. I, I, we've been using it pretty frequently here. Um, and this is for license upgrades. If you are purchasing additional users for an ebook, so say you had a one concurrent user book and it's being used for a class, and so you'd like, so um, someone puts in an order for the unlimited, you can use a license upgrade, and that kind of helps associate the two orders, the one for the single use and the license upgrade together, and you can kind of keep a record of, of all of that. Um, another nice thing about the license upgrade is you can create it without a fund and price. So say something just migrates to a new platform and that it used to be five users and now it's unlimited. You have the option of creating a license upgrade um, order just to track all that information within the order side of Alma, not just the collection side. The other types are standing orders. We do not use these for e-resources. Um, but that is an option that's available. And then other service. So these are things without inventory. We frequently use them for memberships, sometimes for certain fees, recurring fees every year, um, software that doesn't need a bib record, but we need to track the purchasing information. We would use the other service. One of the required fields for a purchase order line is the acquisition method. And this defines how Alma, how you're placing your order as viewed by Alma. Um, and so you can, if you select purchase, that means you're doing all of your ordering within the system. So at no point are you going to email the vendor or use a system outside of Alma. Um, you basically tell Alma, we're ordering this thing and Alma will use your vendor record, emails and or EDI setups to send that order on your behalf. Um, purchase that vendor system is the one we use most frequently. And that means the purchase is actually handled externally, usually through email, through the Gobi system for us um, or some other system. You do have the option of selecting approval or um, depository exchange. I have never used so I'm not going to speak to it, um, but that is an option there for you. And you have gift and technical as well. Um, one thing to note, depository gift and technical, you do not have to have a price or a fund code since, um, since those often do not have a price associated with them. Technical is great for multi-part orders. It's also really necessary for um, print plus electronic orders. So we get a few print and online journal journal subscriptions. Alma can't handle both print and online on the same purchase order line. You have to have two separate ones, but we only get invoiced one time. 
So we use technical to track either the print or electronic side that's not being um, invoiced. There are a few other e-resource order methods. Oops, sorry about that. Um, you have EDI, EOD, and API. So I've mentioned them a few times. EDI is electronic data interchange. So you can either, you can have um, orders placed in Alma and sent via an FTP server. EOD, embedded order data, is more for creating POLs. Um, and this you'd use import profiles to create a file of the inventory and bib records. And then those POLs get automatically created based on the info in that file. So we use EOD records um, for Gobi. There are some real-time ordering options with Oasis and Gobi. And I know I'll be investigating the Gobi real-time ordering very soon for us. Um, it's something we'd like to, like to integrate soon. Um, but it's just that vendors integrate their ordering system into Alma and it's real time using the Alma API. So before we jump into a live demo, does anyone have any questions about all of that information? All right. So in that case, I'm going to jump into Alma and walk through one or two quick orders. Um, we are in my instance of, of Alma. Um, I'm going to try to limit kind of poking around too much because I don't want to share too much of our fund and vendor information. Um, but the first step when you're creating an order any time is to make sure you don't already have something. So um, one thing to note about the search interfaces in Alma is that if you were searching in all titles, you're searching a different index than the electronic titles, which is a different index than, than the order lines. So while you might search for an ebook as an electronic portfolio, which I'm going to do. Let me pull up the title, here we go. So we're going to look for this title, Migrant Crossings. It looks like we don't have it, right? It's not in my institution zone under electronic title search. But it's always good to double check the alt titles um, because occasionally you find something funky. And you see, we do have a physical title, um, but clearly someone wants an ebook, so so that's OK. Occasionally, you'll find things um, like old, old orders, I'll find in the order line search that are for like old subscriptions and we don't need an active bib, but that is good to know that you are searching different indexes when you search in these three different, different spots. Um, so like I said, we're looking for this title. We do not have it in our institution zone. Unlike physical resources, your next step is not to check the network zone. The only reason you would check there is maybe you think we get it through JSTOR or Academic Complete via the, the WLC um, consortial purchasing, but that would be the only reason to check the network zone. You would never um, do your order placement from a network zone e resource record, or you would rarely, if ever. So then you would look in the community zone and you'll see, okay, the title's coming up, that's great. And it looks like it's available from the Groider, EBSCO and ProQuest. So say the, the selector wanted us to get it from ProQuest, you then find the correct collection that you want the portfolio and order from. So for us, if we're ordering a single ebook, um, we would use the ebook central perpetual collection. You can always just jump into the record if you want to double check it's the right one by clicking on it. You can also always check to make sure it really is kind of where you think it's going by selecting the ellipses and then the linking. And you can see, yes, this is the ebook central ProQuest platform that is the one I want. 
So when you're creating an order, you do not want to select activate first. You will go to order and that will immediately bring you into the purchase order line creation screen. Um, Alma is going to recommend what they think you'll want here. You do have the option of ignoring them, say this was a license upgrade, we could do that. Um, but in this case, they were correct. You can select your library and go from there. So you'll notice that immediately the purchase order line number is automatically created. You have your PO line type you just selected and you'll notice that, that the status is in review um, and it will stay in, in review until you send this purchase order line to be packaged. Like I said, you can add a license. Um, I'm not going to add a license to this. I tend to add licenses to collections, not portfolios because licenses are usually associated with the collection um, in our instance of almost, there's no need to duplicate that work. Here you can add your access model. So let's say the selector wanted a three simultaneous user copy. You will add your material supplier. Um, for us, say we're getting it directly from ProQuest, that normally wouldn't happen, but let's pretend. For us, we have not fully cleaned up our our vendors since we migrated, we just have not had the manpower. Um, so often our access providers and our, um, I know that, that one's the correct one, and the material suppliers are not going to match even if you're getting it from the same vendor. As Sarah pointed out, you can add, this is where if you had set automatic defaults for ProQuest, they would fill in here. Um, you can add those dates if you'd want. You would want to put the list price in. I'm only adding a dollar because like I said, this is my real Alma instance and I don't want to mess with someone's fund if they're in the system and doing any actual ordering. Um, we can use Soch. That's our sociology book fund. Here is where you select your acquisition method. And like I said, we will be purchasing this directly from ProQuest outside of the system. So you would want to use purchase at vendor system. You can add a material type. Um, we use reporting codes here at Mason. So I would select the ebook reporting code. And at this point, you have the option of either three ways, say this is ready to go. You can add notes and things as you need them, but say this is ready to go. You have three options to get this to the PO packaging stage. You can manually package it, which means you would have to go down here and select this box. What that does is then requires an extra step for you when you're creating the PO. You would actually have to manually go in and package, um, put a bunch of PO lines together before you create a PO. If you click save and continue, you can, that will move this to the auto packaging um, status and those PO lines would get packaged as a in a job that usually runs overnight. Now say you wanted to order this right away, it was a single line, you know it's going to be a single line invoice, you can select order now and that will automatically put this into a PO and um, it will move to status sent. So I'm gonna just select order now. Oh, sorry about my phone. <laughs> and we will go from there. So let's see, all right. So you'll see it'll still say in review. If you now click on it, it will move to the sent. So that's the basic um, way to create a PO. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Hey, Jocelyn, we have a question from the chat. I mean, it's an open-ended one for the group, but I thought um, I would ask you. Um, Glenn asks, how do other libraries handle purchasing two one-user copies of an ebook if one user is the only model available? 
Do you have any insight for that? I think in that case, it might be one where we use the license upgrade and note that we're purchasing a second one user copy and then link associate those two POLs together. So um, in a PO line, you have the option of associating them. And then those two, you could always see that there were two orders placed. But that's, I think, how we would do it. I don't know if, if other people have any other ways of doing it. Um, Stacy um, adds from the chat that she thinks we place, this is we at AU, place two orders, one order per copy, but she's double checking with her ebook person. All right, any other questions? Um, a couple other things to note that order without inventory. So for things like fees or memberships lives here under the purchase order line. Um, if you are manually packaging a PO, you would have to go in to purchase order and then package. And we usually have a few in there, so let's see. We do. Um, and like I said, you would have to manually, so say data stream and this book for whatever reason, you wanted to put on the same PO, you can manually add those all to the same PO that way. And you'll see here, so the PO line status is manual packaging. All right, well, if there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah. Okay, um, Jocelyn, if, do you have the screen up? If you don't mind sharing, that would be, well, you know what, hold on. <laughs> I'm so glad this is being recorded for posterity. Um, <laughs> That's how you know. Uh, okay. <sighs> Share. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly talk about renewals and then I'm going to show you what renewals look like um, in Alma. You'll get to see some exciting AU data, um, which I know you've all been waiting for. So choosing to use automatic or manual renewals really depends on whether you intend to do your renewals within the um, renewal workflow in Alma. So automatic renewals um, use the renewal date, which you can see um, on this screenshot, the renewal cycle uh, and the renewal reminder period to basically automatically renew a PLL, regardless of whether it's been paid or not. So that's important to keep in mind. So we do use these dates. We use um, automatic renewal and the dates at AU. Um, partially because I hate having task lists full of things that tell me I need to do stuff. And also because I think it's important to be able to get clean data out um, with the renewal cycle where it is. Um, I also use this uh, for forecasting. So um, what I mean by that is if I wanna see what our remaining renewals are for the next four months, I can project out using the renewal date in its entirety, as long as it's accurate. If you choose to use manual renewal, the resource will require you to manually update the renewal date every time you pay the invoice. Um, they're not necessarily tied together. So when you pay the invoice, you don't necessarily get the option to update the renewal date. You have to go back to the POL and update that. Um, one of the ways that we do use manual renewals at AU is for resources that are under some form of consideration, either cancellation or upgrades or, um, you know, the I know the vendor is going to be changing in the next year. And so um, I put them into manual renewal to pull them into the task list. The other ways that we use this is for resources where we pay with a credit card or resources that tend to fall through the cracks. So we all have vendors who um, they would really like us to pay, but they don't send us invoices in any kind of organized or timely fashion. And those can um, easily disappear in the renewal cycle. Um, I also tend to use the manual renewal. Again, these are just use cases. You guys can use this however you want, but I tend to use them for um, things like deferred POLs where I've made a, a change or haven't had to pay a POL within a giving, given fiscal year, I use the manual renewal function to force myself to look at it the next fiscal year. 
So um, before we do look at those examples of renewals, um, I want to briefly mention subscription to and from dates, from and to dates. Um, so neither of these fields is mandatory in um, to save your POLs. Uh, for continuations or continuing POLs, you do have to have a renewal date and Alma will get touchy if you uh, don't have one. Um, but you do need to pay attention because if you add a subscription end date, this is one of the only times that Alma will um, close the POL on that date. So Jocelyn said that it never closes them because it assumes you don't want it to be closed and she's right, unless you put this date in. Um, they, the thought is that renewals will go on forever and Alma is built that way. And so um, the subscription to date I tend to use when I know that something is gonna be canceled or um, closed, but I want the POL to be open until the end of our subscription period. Um, I also plan to use these fields for administrative information. So again, going into analytics, being able to track the length of time we've subscribed to a product, things for things like perpetual coverage. And um, again, just pulling in that data from analytics. So um, just to reiterate, these are not mandatory fields and Jocelyn is correct. They do expect you to keep your subscriptions open forever, but you don't have to. Um, let me share my screen again. Okay, why are you not? There we go. Nope, it didn't work. Oh, there we go. Can you guys see my uh, browser? Okay, I'm gonna assume you can. Mm, um, we're, we're, just, we're just just seeing these PowerPoint. Okay, cool. Let me try it again. Hold on. Share. How about now? Nope. Oh, goodness gracious. We use Teams a lot, and so I am familiar with Zoom, but I feel like I don't transition well between the two, you know? It's like, today has been a Teams day, not a Zoom day. How about now? We got it. Okay, sweet. Thank you, Michael. Um, okay, so I'm still on the vendors, um, but I am going to show you how to get to the renewal task list. Um, so again, from your acquisitions menu, you are going to come straight across to your renew. This takes you to that renewal workflow task list that Alma will create for you. Um, and it just has things that are in manual renewal. So you can see that, for example, this one right here, I'm actually gonna search this so you can see what it looks like in the order search, but this sucker is one where we pay it directly, but it tends to get lost if I don't or, Let's be honest, Alexandra stays on top of me, my invoicing coordinator. Um, here's one where I've done something weird to the POL, so I wanna remind myself to go back and check and make sure that it is, um, it should really not cost any money. Um, and so that tends to be the way that I use this list. Again, you've got your filters on the side, which um, I find tend to be really useful for orders. I wish I could select more than one in each filter because I feel like that would make my life better, but so far that's not a functionality that's offered. So to show you what this looks like in the order lines, I am going to search for the Fieldiana. Um, I am going to use the POL number. And you'll notice that it has a go to task list. So you basically can't edit anything unless you go to the task list if you use manual renewal. So once you click go to the task list, it will take you to that renewal workflow where you will then have the option to edit that POL. Um, this one, for instance, we get a note that it's published irregularly, which might give me a clue as to why I did what I did. And then I can always go and check and change my renewal date. So let's say I'm gonna update this to be 01, 28 minutes, 2021 already. Um, and then I can click save. And it's been renewed. So it's been removed from the list until the next time it hits that um, renewal cycle and renewal reminder and the renewal date. Questions about that? Okay, 
I know a lot of institutions manage their renewals outside of Alma um, for the reasons that uh, Jocelyn actually mentioned, which had to do with data cleanup post-migration. Uh, it was overwhelming for a lot of schools, including AU. And so um, uh, it, it, I don't expect a lot of your institutions to be making use of it because I think that it's, it's difficult to kind of spend the time to get it to the point where it is usable. Uh, but I'll pass it back to Jocelyn for invoicing. Okay, invoicing. Um, I'm going to be relatively brief with invoicing. Um, the basic invoicing workflow is the same for all materials, whether physical versus electronic um, and one time versus subscription with the only exception being subscription overlap dates and that kind of thing. Oh, just to cover the roles you'll need if you're handling invoices at all would be either you need the invoice manager or you need to be an invoice operator and the invoice operated extended. Again, you need the extended one if you're deleting anything. Um, so the basic workflow for invoices is based on pre-configured rules that are customized for each institution. So what we have set up at Mason is likely not what you have at yours. It, it has to do with um, if you want to review everything based over certain dollar amounts, that kind of stuff. Um, and you can and customize that. So you'd want to check with your configurations if you're having issues moving an invoice to the next step. Um, but the basic workflow is that it's created and there are a number of ways to create an invoice. And I'll talk about that shortly in a second. But once it's created, it uses those automatic rules basically to validate it and process it. And if something is missing or inaccurate, it will bump that back to you um, for review until you get all the information corrected. The invoice then moves to uh, the review process. And again, depending on your institution setting, it can either kind of automatically move to approval or some move through approval or some um, schools probably have it set. So every single invoice needs to be manually approved. Um, we tend to have that because sometimes one, like our ER specialist might enter an invoice, but we want our fiscal coordinator to touch every invoice and make sure everything's okay and matching what's in hand. Um, so we tend to have manual approval here. And then finally, it, the invoice gets paid, um, at which point the order can be closed if it's one time, or like I said, you'll be waiting for renewals um, at that point. So invoice creation, there are several ways. As I said, EDI pops up again here, um, kind of in the reverse of the ordering. So invoices are placed on an FTP location, an FTP server by a vendor. Um, and then you set up that vendor's EDI information in Alma and the invoices are automatically loaded. Invoice lines are automatically populated. In theory, it works perfectly. I found it very rarely does. And usually they need um, some editing and some some weird things can happen with EDI invoices, but we do use them for our subscription agents um, here at Mason. So when you're getting that big January, you know, 50 to 100 line invoices and several of them, um, the EDI comes in handy because trying to manually enter all of those, those PO lines would be exhausting. Um, you also have the creation option of creating an invoice from the purchase order. And the invoice lines will automatically be created based on the PO details. So um, sometimes this is useful when you're doing that manual PO creation. If you know you're going to be getting an invoice for three titles, you can manually package them into one PO and then create an invoice from there. And all of those lines will be um, auto-populated for you. 
Just a little note, when you create an invoice from a PO, the PO number is also assigned as the invoice number. Um, you can usually edit that, but it's something to pay attention to that you will probably need to go in there and manually edit the invoice number. Then you can always manually create your invoice. We do this for the bulk of our ordering. And um, finally, you have the option of loading invoices from an Excel file. I have never done this, but I'm intrigued by it. So I would be curious if anyone here has explored the Excel file option, um, but I can't really speak to it. I, I think there were some um, chatter on the listserv about this recently, if I remember correctly. Similar to PO lines, invoices receive various statuses as they move through the workflow. Um, and they're pretty self-explanatory. There's not nearly as many <laughs> as the PO lines. So you have your in review, your approval. So if in approval, if it's waiting for manual approval, um, waiting for payment. So that that invoice has been approved and now you actually need to enter some more payment details. And then finally, when it's closed and the invoice is paid. I think that's all I had. I hadn't planned on, um, Man, doing a walkthrough of invoicing in Alma, but I'm happy to do so if there's interest. It's just not, I didn't know um, if we would have time or anything, but we're doing well on time. So I will leave that up to you. If you'd like me to walk through creating an invoice, just let me know. If not, um, does anyone have any questions? About anything, it doesn't have to be specifically invoicing either. <laughs> Now's a great time to ask. Um, you've got kind of a captive audience, and um, Jocelyn, I know that Alexandra. She mentions in the chat that she um, it works pretty well. She's used the Excel invoice creation from Excel. She did it for our Elsevier journals, um, and it it does work really well. Um, I'm going to volunteer her to share whatever her process is, or if she'd like to talk about it, um, and then she can beat me I, up later. No, I mean, I can speak to it a little bit, but I definitely highly recommend trying it in the sandbox once you think you have it set up correctly. I had to tinker with my reporting code because I think you need the actual code and not the descriptor, um, which might be obvious to some people, but it took me a try to get it right. But it is a really great way, like our Elsevier is, I think, 120 lines every year, and it they don't do EDI um, and you can have the file and then just use it year after year changing the prices and it's, it's it works pretty well once you get it going. I will say that the Excel file that they offer you is an old version of Excel so your computer kind of squawks when you try to save it because it's the old version, but it works once you load it. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to have to try it, I think, as we Mason, at least, is probably looking at breaking up more and more big deals. So those giant journal invoices are definitely coming. <laughs> They're in your future. So acquisitions, I mean, I, again, we can let you go early. That's fine, too. But acquisitions is such a big area. As I was clicking in through the menu to show some stuff, I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, are there other things? We should have gone into more depth. Does anyone have any questions about what we didn't cover? Um, and you know, questions about um, about uh, other acquisitions functions that we we didn't talk about. Okay, we have a question from Matthew. Could you talk a bit about occasions when things are purchased and or licensed at the title level, but paid for as a single lump sum? So for example, Canopy and Swank, he thinks, uh, would you create technical POLs for each title? Would you have a bib record just for PL POL purposes, but not access? Jocelyn, I'll let you take first stab. So for Canopy, we have one lump POL and it's basically with the Canopy allocation as the total PO line price. And then we just use that for each invoice that we get. Um, we do not create 
technical POLs for Canopy or Swank because they're only year long licenses. I think if they were perpetual, we would definitely, we definitely create, would create um, an actual POL for titles that were perpetual access or longer access, but we just do too many, I think, to be able to handle all the individual Swank and Canopy titles. Yeah, Alexandra says that at AU we do it the same way. Um, so I don't, I'm not involved with this at AU, um, but I will chime in for what I, I did at my last job and um, people can tell me to shut up. But I think that with the move to Alma, it became, it made less sense to take up record counts with creating individual POLs for things that got paid out of a lump sum. Um, but I think, I know at AU we do something similar to this. You've create, you can create a fund ledger for a deposit account and basically just if you want to create POLs per title, you could then choose to do that um, and pull I from that fund. That. <laughs> hmm? Stacy, I can describe what we do. Yes, yes, Stacy, great, thank you. I, you know, laboriously do it. <laughs> <laughs> it is yours, yep. So we have, we have the main ledger and so we have a deposit account with Canopy. So we will send them a lump sum of money once a year, twice a year. In fact, we just, I just sent Alexandra an invoice today to give them $5,000 more. But we have, a, we have an open PO in our normal ledger where we allocate whatever, $20,000 for Canopy this year. And we just draw off of that when we send the money to replenish the deposit account. And then this year I started, I never tracked Canopy and we, the, the um, media librarian had a lot of problems with their dashboard trying to reconcile what he thought we had and what they were saying we had as far as the balance of you know the money that they had on account for us. It was a mess. I hate Canopy. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, <laughs> so I decided to create with Alma, I did, uh, decided to create a new ledger. So I have a, a separate ledger for deposit accounts. And I do the same thing uh, for our PDA through ProQuest. I, I do this tracking. So July 1, I created this new ledger. I have a, you know, a portion of it for Canopy. I allocate what Canopy and American University agree that the balance in the deposit account is. So that's the initial starting allocation. And once a month, we get quote unquote an invoice from Canopy um, uh, about how much we've spent that month that month on the films that we've licensed. And so um, I create invoices in this ledger it's you know it's not real money it's it's sort of a mirror thing to be able to track um but the the other thing that is wrapped up into that is that we are now putting notes in the in the canopy records for when the license expires um matthew is is on here and he was the one who you know we first started when he was here at au doing that so that's like tied into my workflow of creating this invoice is also making, cause I put the note in also making sure that the note is in there. And um, so conceivably what I see as a balance in my Canopy ledger should be exactly the same that Canopy is seeing in their, in their ledger. Um, but when I, when I create the invoice, I go through the steps that uh, Jocelyn uh, demonstrated, or Sarah, I can't remember which one of you demonstrated it, you know, I select access model. So it's either a one year or a three year, sometimes we license for three years, the film, you know, I'll put that in. So it is, it is a, a nice way to be able to um, get that information in the, in the record for these titles. Does that all make sense? It's, yeah, I was going to say, thank you, Stacy. That's actually yeah. very, that's very clear. It's more work than we ever did with Canopy, but we felt because Canopy was such a problem on their end, we felt it was, and, and it allows us to now put that, it's sort of putting that 
note into the record of Canopy, putting in the access model, like we're adding value added information by being able to do this. But so far, I think it's working. Thank you. Yeah, I would say um, uh, question about rollover. Andrea, I will get to you. So I'd say that uh, Jocelyn adds, we had the same problem last year. We don't do deposits with Canopy anymore because of it. Um, and I really understand why you would not want to do that, but <laughs> our, our media librarian, we have a very controlled, um, it's supposed to be a 100% mediated program with Canopy, and th this year it is working out better. Um, they have changed their, their uh, dashboard to better reflect, I don't know, they blame their accounting system, it was, it was a mess, but this year seems to be better than it was last year with them. Cool. Um, Andrea has a question about rollover to the group. Do we use encumbrance to roll over for, I'm assuming e-resources or price to roll over? I will take first stab and then open the floor. Um, I'm very chatty, so I'm sorry for that. But um, we actually use, I would prefer to use price to roll over. That tends to be what we we do, and then we do add an inflation percentage when we um, when we roll over. We didn't really. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I debated long and hard about talking about funds. Um, but we do use encumbrances, uh, and that's one of the ways that I track it, which is why I use the price um, so that it's closer to accurate. I guess I should ask, does everyone understand, we, we, we've used a lot of language, I guess we assumed there was some basic um, uh, acquisitions knowledge, but with the funds and the ledgers that refers to kind of the way that the, the money is structured and described. Um, and then rollover has to do with fiscal close. So at the end of the year, um, when we shut down our expenditures for the year, we can roll over our continuations um, into the next year to basically create them again for the new fiscal year. Again, apologies if everybody knows that, just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, well, if um, there aren't any more questions, um, Michael, Jocelyn, are you okay if we close it down or would you like to sit here in silence for the next <laughs> 20 minutes? I don't think there's any need for that. Um, <laughs> I wanna thank both of our presenters and our participants. Um, this was a, a good, very clear session. Um, as mentioned, we are um, recording these. It's going to take a little time. We're going to do, deal with some editing of the transcripts to make sure that we have captioning available. And then those will be going up on Basecamp, the, um, the Electronic Resources Basecamp. So watch for a message there. Um, if you're interested in the next week's presentation on usage statistics, it's the same Zoom link, same day, same time. So um, you're welcome to come back then. Thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend.